Welcome to Pavenars, webinars for the payment community. Today we're going to talk about a brief introduction to Hot Mix Asphalt, or HMA, mix design. And this is a 2021 update. The original introduction to HMA mix design Pavenar was held and recorded on March 6, 2012, and it was posted on YouTube on September 10, 2018. Since then, it has had over 1,000 views, thank you for that, and because of that, an update is warranted. We're going to begin with a background on the components of HMA and the mixed design objectives and methods, regardless of which method you use. We're then going to give an overview of some historical mixed design methods, including the V mixed design and the Marshall mixed design. Next, we'll cover superpaved mix design, which includes discussion about the asphalt binder, the asphalt mixture, and a concept called superpave 5. Finally, we'll finish up with some alternative mix design methods, which include the Bailey method, balanced mix design, and regressing air voids. So to begin with the components of hot mix asphalt, you begin with the aggregate, and you generally take various different types of aggregate, you dry it, you heat it, and you mix it with asphalt binder. However, there is a third component of HMA which is absolutely critical to the success of the performance, and that is air. So taking a look at these three components, aggregates take up anywhere from approximately 84 to 93% of the volume of hot mix asphalt, and anywhere between 93 and 97% of the mass. And this does vary based on the type of hot mix asphalt you're placing. Some important characteristics of aggregates can be divided into source properties and consensus properties. Source properties include toughness, soundness, deleterious materials, and gradation. And consensus properties include particle shape, which can indicate percent crushed faces, flat and elongated particles and angularity, and also clay content. Asphalt binder takes about 2 to 6 percent of the hot mix asphalt volume, or about 4 to 7 percent of the mass, and important characteristics include viscosity, rutting and permanent deformation, and cracking. And then finally, air can take anywhere from 1 to 16 percent of the HMA volume, and always a popular quiz question, what is the mass of air? It's zero, regardless of how much there is. And the HMA is designed to be flexible, and the air is absolutely critical for this flexible behavior. Now, taking a very broad overview of mixed designs, the objective of any mixed design is to develop an economical blend of aggregates and asphalt that meet the design requirements. At the end of the day, that's all we're trying to do is take some aggregates and asphalt and make a good design. Key strategies of any good mixed design include selecting and proportioning of the aggregates, the asphalt, cement, and then the void structure. Once you have that blend of aggregates, asphalt, cement, also known as asphalt binder, and the air, the mixture must resist permanent deformation, fatigue damage, thermal cracking, and moisture damage. How do we go about doing that? Key steps of a mixed design. First include the asphalt cement or asphalt binder selection. You must select your aggregate and the blending proportion, and this gives you a design of the aggregate structure. You batch the aggregate and you mix it with the asphalt binder, and then you compact the hot mix asphalt samples, for example, on a super paved gyratory compactor. You then take volumetric measurements and you analyze those volumetric measurements. And this can include air voids, it can include voids in mineral aggregate, or VMA, voids filled with asphalt, or VFA, and effective asphalt content. And with those five steps, various different mixed design methods have been developed. Here is just a brief overview of each one with pictures of the compactors. So the V method was developed in 1920, and it's currently used in a couple of western states. 
The Marshall Method was developed in the 1930s. It's not used anymore in the United States at any state level, but it is used in many local agencies. So it's very helpful to have in mind when we're thinking about mixed designs. The superpaved mixed design was developed in the 1990s and it was built off the Veeam and Marshall methods and it considers traffic and climate as well. This is what's used in most states and some local agencies, but the equipment investment is quite high, so there is a decent amount of money involved with getting the superpaved mixed design up and going. So with that overview and background, we'll move on to some of the historical mixed design methods. Let's start with the V-mix design procedure. You first select your aggregate, you then select your asphalt binder, you prepare your sample, for example, in a Veeam compactor, and then you determine the stability on the left, which is a Veeam cohesiometer. You then can predict, you then can calculate your density and your air voids, and you then find your optimal asphalt binder content. When we're thinking about the aggregate selection, Veeam did not develop a specific aggregate evaluation or selection procedure, but these steps in general are used. You want to first determine the aggregate physical properties you're interested in. That includes toughness and abrasion, durability and soundness, cleanliness, particle shape, and surface texture. You want to follow some aggregate descriptive properties, which includes gradation, specific gravity, and absorption. And then you need to perform blending calculations to achieve the gradation that you desire with the aggregates that you want to use. For the asphalt binder selection, much like the aggregate selection, Veeam did not develop a specific asphalt binder evaluation or selection procedures, but most agencies that use the Veeam mix design use tests such as penetration, viscosity, age res residue, or superpave to determine their asphalt binder selection. When we're talking about preparing Veeam samples, we first create several trial aggregate asphalt binder blends. We then estimate the optimal asphalt binder content from either experience or the centrifuge kerosene equivalent, CKE test. And what you can do with that second option is you first determine the CKE equivalent, then you figure out and calculate the coarse aggregate surface capacity, and with those two values, you can estimate the asphalt content. You then compact with a California kneading compactor, which gives you samples that are four inches in diameter and two and a half inches high. It's a tamper foot compaction method, which applies 350 to 500 PSI of compaction pressure, and it uses 150 blows. Once you've made your samples, you can run some performance test. This is a picture of the exterior of the Veeam stabilometer. So we saw the interior schematic earlier, but this measures the resistance to deformation, and it does that by quantifying the lateral pressure after applying a vertical load. So you place a sample in the Veeam cohesiometer, you push down on it, and you quantify the lateral pressure. There's also the Veeam cohesiometer. This measures the cohesive strength of a sample. And a sample is placed on the left side of the image below underneath those uh, clamps. And then you place shot in the bucket on the right hand side and the sample is bent as that cantilever bend beam goes downward until the sample splits into two with a cohesive failure. During this step, you also quantify the density and the air voids. Now you can look at this graphically quite nicely, and you actually take the bottom and you work your way up to the top. So you have a variety of different asphalt contents, and you measure the flushing. And the most flush sample is eliminated. You then eliminate the sample that doesn't meet stability. And then with the remaining samples, you choose the asphalt content with the with greater than 4% air voids, and that is your optimal binder content. So that is a brief overview of the V-mix design procedure. Now we can move on to the Marshall mix design procedure. 
With the Marshall Mix Design Procedure, you first select your aggregate, then you select your asphalt binder. You prepare your samples, and then you measure the stability and the flow of those samples. You calculate the density and air voids, and you choose your optimal asphalt binder content selection. So you can see this is similar to Veeam uh, in these six steps, and also similar to Veeam is that Marshall does not have specific common aggregate and asphalt binder tests. So like Veeam, you often use other types of aggregate tests and either penetration, viscosity, or superpave for your asphalt binder tests. Now we're talking about the Marshall sample preparation. You first create several trial aggregate asphalt binder blends. You then estimate the optimal binder content and you compact at negative 1%, negative 5%, positive 5%, and 1% of estimate. And then you compact with the Marshall hammer. And this is a four inch diameter sample and two and a half inches in height. It also uses a tamper foot, but it uses an 18 inch free fall of a hammer with a 10 pound weight. And you do either 35, 50, or 75 blows on each side of the sample, so you actually flip the sample halfway through the compaction procedure, and the number of blows depends on the traffic level. Now looking at the Marshall stability and flow tests, these are different performance tests than Veeam. For the Marshall stability, you have you calculate the maximum load that a specimen can hold, and you use a loading rate of two inches per minute. And you can see on the right there, you actually have the sample rotated 90 degrees, and it's kind of in two C-shape clamps. Now the Marshall flow, actually you get that number off of the Marshall stability test. So you get both numbers off one single test because the dial gauge measures the specimen's plastic flow. And the flow is recorded in 0.01% increments at the same time as the maximum load. So you have both the flow and the stability off of the graph on the right. And you measure the density and the air voids. Now, in order to measure the different properties and the optimal asphalt binder content, you start with 4% air voids. So you start at the y-axis on the graph, and you figure out what the percent asphalt binder by weight is at that 4% air voids. Once you have found that optimal asphalt content, which appears to be about 6.1% in this graph, you can find the other values. So this is the one graph where you work from the y-axis to the x-axis, but all the other graphs work from the x-axis to the y-axis. So you can find your asphalt binder by weight, 6.1%. You go up to the density line and you can find what is your density at that 6.1%. The same with the flow. What is the flow at 6.1% asphalt? What is the Marshall stability at 6.1% asphalt? What is the percent VFA? And what is the percent VMA at that 6.1% asphalt content? So the 6.1% optimal asphalt content is determined by the air voids. And then you can find the density, the flow, the Marshall stability, the percent VFA, and the percent VMA based on that optimal asphalt content. So moving from some of these historical mix design methods over to the superpave mix design method, the superpave mix design procedure starts with your aggregate selection and then you choose your asphalt binder. You prepare your samples and you run your performance tests. You run your density and air voids calculations. You can then find your optimal asphalt binder content and then finally, there's a seventh step. This is where you run your moisture susceptibility and you evaluate your moisture susceptibility, which you use the indirect tensile strength test for, or ITS. So with your aggregate selection, there are restrictions on aggregate gradation using control points. So this is minimum and maximum limits on percent passing. You have your consensus requirements, and these are properties you can change in the aggregate, which includes coarse and fine aggregate angularity, flat and elongated particles and clay content. And then you have source requirements which you cannot change, which includes LA abrasion, soundness, and water absorption. 
For the asphalt binder, you determine the appropriate asphalt binder grade, which we call performance grade binder, PG binder, by pavement temperature, air temperature, and your geographic area. You then verify your binder properties with testing, which includes rotational viscometry, excuse me, rotational viscometer or RV, dynamic shearometer or DSR, which you can see on the right is two parallel plates, the bending beam rheometer, which is the BBR, and the direct tension tester, which is the DTT. Note that the direct tension tester is very rarely used these days, and the BBR does most of our low temperature binder evaluation. And if you want to learn more about asphalt binder and asphalt binder properties, I encourage you to take a look at the Rheological Parameters of Asphalt Binder Pavenar, which was recorded on September 6, 2021. Once you have your aggregate in your asphalt binder, you can start preparing your samples. So you create several trial aggregate asphalt binder blends. By numerical calculation, you first estimate your optimal asphalt binder content, and then you usually compact at negative 0.5%, positive 0.5%, and 1% of that estimate. You then compact with the gyratory compactor, and you can see here the samples are a little larger. They're six inches in diameter and four and a half inches high. And essentially what happens is you place your material in a mold, which is flat and circular and has a diameter of 5.89 inches, which gives you an area of 27.24 square inches. And you apply 87 PSI of compaction pressure or 600 kilopascals and what happens is the mold tilts so that mold with an interior diameter of 5.89 inches it tilts and it rotates 360 degrees which is called a gyration and these number of gyrations vary but with this inclination of 1.25 degrees and rotating at 30 revolutions per minute you get a bit of kneading compaction, which simulates the rolling in the field. Now, some of the performance tests and the moisture susceptibility that we run. Some performance tests that were developed with SuperPave include the SuperPave shear tester, which is not used very, more, very often anymore, the indirect tensile tester, or the IDT, and for permanent deformation, we have multiple tests, including the Hamburg and the APA, we have various tests for fatigue cracking, and we have various other tests for low temperature cracking as well. So the two tests that were developed with SuperPave were the SuperPave shear tester and the indirect tensile tester, but there are various other tests that have been developed since then that can quantify permanent deformation, fatigue cracking, and low temperature cracking. For moisture susceptibility, we run ASHTO T283, which is the indirect tensile test, and here you're looking at both conditioned and unconditioned samples. So you have some samples that you just run normally and others that you have soaked and frozen, which conditions, and conditions them and which forces water into the sample. And you take a look at how much does that forcing water into the sample compromise the quality of the test. And you want an 80% minimum ratio of the tensile strength of the condition sampled versus the tensile strength of the unconditioned sample. And then of course we calculate the density and the air voids. Very similar to the Marshall, we find the optimal asphalt binder by weight, and that's based on 4% air voids. So we're moving from the y-axis, 4% air voids to the line, and then drop down to the optimal asphalt binder. And it looks like it's about 5.5% in this graph. And then we can find the VMA, and it needs to meet a minimum with that asphalt binder. We find the VFA, and it needs to meet a range with that asphalt binder. And then we find the density as well. So this is the basic mixed design that was developed in the late 80s and early 90s for SuperPave. But there have been recent modifications to the SuperPave mixed design procedure. And this is actually the first alternate mix design that we will be looking at. And that's called SuperPave 5. And in addition to using all of the other steps of the SuperPave binder grading procedure, 
there were some deviations. So for example, in superpaved design procedure, we try and shoot 4% 4, 4 air voids in the field and 7% air voids as our target density in the field. So I'm sorry, I misspoke. We target 4% density in the lab, 4% air voids in the lab, and we target 7% air voids in the field. Now there are some issues with that. For example, statistically, if we meet our in-place density in the field, so if we're meeting that 7% air void density in the field, that may result in up to 10% of the pavement area being lower than that desired density. And that's because you're paving miles and miles of pavement and you only take so many density readings. So you're only taking so many air void readings along your pavement stretch. That means statistically up to 10% of your pavement may actually be lower than the desired density. And what happens is this leads to premature aging and a loss of durability. So the concept of top behind SuperPay 5 is you follow all the rest of the SuperPave design procedure but instead of targeting 4% air voids in the lab, you increase to 5% air voids in the lab. And this means that your initial in-place density of 95% could be achieved in the field. And that would lower the percentage of area that is below the desired density, which would reduce the chance of the premature aging and reduce the chance of durability. So this is a very brief overview. If you're interested in more, John Haddock up at Purdue and his research team produced a very nice report called Implementing the SuperPay 5 Asphalt Mixture Design Method in Indiana. And you can see all the information there on the slide. So we've covered a background of SuperPave. Um, we covered a background of Marshall. We covered a background of Veeam. We've covered the general background of hot mix asphalt and the mixed design procedures. So we've moved through a lot of good content. And now I'm just briefly going to go over some alternate mixed design procedures that have been developed since SuperPave. So the first alternate mixed design procedure we'll look at is the Bailey method. And the Bailey method revolves around concepts of aggregate packing. And the coarse and the fine aggregate are critical in the Bailey method. Next, we'll talk about balanced mix design. And this has actually gained a lot of traction in the past few years. And this is also built on volumetrics. But you really focus on the lab performance tests as well. And these lab performance tests are cracking and rutting tests. And then finally, the third alternative method we'll look at is regressing air voids. And this is where we target 4% air voids into the design, but then we just simply increase the asphalt binder content to target either 3.5% or 3% air voids in our design. So let's work through these three methods in a bit more detail. So the Bailey method is quite interesting because it's based on packing characteristics of aggregate. And what it does is it designs the interlock and the aggregate structure of that aggregate packing. And this focuses on providing aggregate gradation and eva evaluating aggregate blends. So it's not technically a mixed design, but it's absolutely a key part of any successful mixed design procedure. Now, as I mentioned, we divide the aggregate into coarse and fine fractions. An important concept is the primary control sieve, or the PCS, and this is the nominal, nominal maximum aggregate size times 0.22. I just want to have a little side note here. A lot of this Bailey literature actually defines this as the nominal maximum particle size, NMPS, but the more commonly used term these days is nominal maximum aggregate size, or NMAS. However, as far as we're concerned, those two terms are synonymous. Now, according to the Bailey method, the coarse aggregates those are the particles placed in the volume that create voids. So you have some sort of volume, you place the coarse aggregate in there, and then you have voids. And the fine aggregate are the particles that then fill in those voids of the coarse aggregate. So this concept of fine aggregates filling the voids created by the coarse aggregates is very important to the Bailey method. And so you need the following data. For the coarse aggregate, you need the loose unit weight, you need the rotted unit weight, and you need the chosen unit weight. 
So you can see in this diagram below, you have the loose unit weight on the left, the rotted unit weight on the right, and you have the chosen unit weight between those two. And for the fine aggregate, you simply use the rotted unit weight, and that fills in those voids in the coarse aggregate. And you can see also in this diagram, they show where some typical mixtures fall along these bands. So in general, dense graded mixes are below the loose unit weight. Dense graded mixes, a coarse mix is between the chosen unit weight, and then SMA mixes are above the rotted unit weight. So that's just where some mixes generally fall onto the unit weight spectrums. So let's take a look at the steps of blending aggregate for the Bailey method. First, you calculate the volume of the voids in the coarse aggregate. Then you determine the amount of the fine aggregate that needs to fill those voids. You determine the total weight, and then you convert the individual aggregates into actual blend percentages. You correct the coarse aggregate for the fines contained in the coarse aggregate, so you don't have in a coarse aggregate sample, you don't have just coarse aggregate, you also have some fine aggregate in there. So you adjust for the fines in the coarse aggregate and you adjust the blend percentages. And then if you're using either mineral filler or bag house fines, you adjust the fine aggregate percentages. And once you adjust those, you then adjust the blend percentages for a second time. So the the ratios in the Bailey method are very important and you need to determine these ratios. So the coarse aggregate ratio or the CA ratio is the percent passing the half sieve minus the percent passing the PCS. You divide that by 100 minus the percent passing the half sieve. And if you recall, the PCS stands for the primary control sieve and the half sieve is just the sieve size. It's half of the nominal maximum aggregate size. For the fine aggregate ratio, you have actually two ratios. You have the coarse portion, which is FAC, and the FAC is the percent passing the SCS divided by the percent passing the PCS, where SCS stands for the secondary control sieve, and it's the 0.22 percentage just on the fine aggregate portion. And then the fine aggregate ratio for the fine portion, or the FAF, is the percent passing the TSC divided by the percent passing the SCS. And this is the TS, the TCS is the tertiary control sieve, and that is 0.22 of the secondary control sieve. So you have the coarse aggregate ratio, the fine aggregate coarse portion ratio, and the fine aggregate fine portion ratio. And looking at a schematic of that, you can see the coarse aggregate between the coarse aggregate and the fine aggregate is the primary control sieve, and then you have both a coarse portion of the fine aggregate and the fine portion of the fine aggregate, and that is determined by the secondary control sieve. And the coarse aggregate is CA, the fine aggregate is FAC for the coarse portion, and the fine aggregate is FAF for the fine portion. And there are some recommendation, recommended ranges for these three ratios based on your nominal maximum aggregate size. So let's just take a look at the far left column. If you have a 37.5 millimeter nominal maximum aggregate size, you want your CA ratio to be between 0.8 and 0.95. You want your FAC ratio to be between 0.35 and 0.50. And you want your FAF ratio to be between 0.35 and 0.50. So lots of good information there. And that is the Bailey method of an alternate mix design. Now, pivoting over to the balance mix design, the most common method of the balance mix, balance mix design method, because there are multiple ones out there, but the most common method uses some sort of volumetric mix design, for example, SuperPave, but then you optimize that volumetric mix design with performance tests. And there are a whole host of performance tests that can be run. For example, for run, rutting, you can use the Hamburg or the Asphalt Pavement Analyzer. For cracking, you can use the iFit SCB, the Louisiana SCB, the Overlay Test, NFlex, Ideal CT, DCT. These are all different types of cracking tests for hot mix asphalt. And what you do is you have the rutting results on one y-axis. You have the cracking results on another y-axis. 
you want some sort of maximum rutting, you want some sort of maximum cracking. And what usually happens is you obtain some sort of range for acceptable rutting and acceptable cracking. So the acceptable cracking is usually a lower asphalt binder content. The acceptable rutting is usually a higher asphalt binder content. Anything higher than the low level for cracking is acceptable cracking binder contents. Anything lower than the high level of rutting is acceptable rutting asphalt contents. So you have some sort of range in there of asphalt contents. Now I've also seen some literature that has a durability performance test as well, typically the Cantabro, and that's not included on this graph, but I did just want to highlight that it is out there. Now, like any good new procedure, there are some issues that are still up for debate. For example, in this balanced mix design, you get a range of asphalt binder content. So you have a range, you don't have a point. So how do you determine the optimal asphalt binder content from the acceptable range. That is a point that is still in debate. Also, another point that's in debate is how feasible is this balanced mix design for use in quality control and quality assurance. So it's, it's great in theory. We're using performance tests in order to help us determine our asphalt binder content, but how does that help us with quality control? How does it help us with quality assurance? That is a point that is still in debate. However, at this point of time, it's my opinion, and this is just my opinion, but I think that the balanced mix design is something that we will be using moving forward more frequently. Now, a third alternative method is regressing air voids, and this is where you target 4% air voids in your design, but then you increase your asphalt binder content to target 3.5% or 3% air voids. And what happens is essentially you're just adding more asphalt binder and you add approximately 0.3 to 0.4% of asphalt binder to move from that 4 to 3% air voids. And when you look at your performance tests, you actually improve your iFit properties, your intermediate temperature properties for cracking, and your DCT properties, your low temperature properties for cracking. And on the right, you can see the iFit is on top and the DCT is on bottom. Um, a study that I was looking at found that there are no adverse effects to rutting, but there are also no benefits. Now, this report that I'm going to mention on the next slide also gave other options to increase asphalt binder content, and that included lowering the design air voids, lowering the gyration levels, and increasing your minimum VMA. So there are other options to this concept of regressing air voids that don't involve increasing the asphalt bind content, binder content, and these were the ones that they listed. So if you'd like more information on these three, I highly encourage you to take a look at Emulsion Circular 44 for the Bailey method. This was put out in October 2002, and this entire circular is on the Bailey method. So lots of great information on there. Um, emulsion Circular EC237 was all on innovative asphalt mixture design procedures, and they have a very nice section on the balanced mix design. And then finally, Randy West and his research team at NCAT uh, put together a real nice study on regressing air voids for balanced HMA mix design. And this is actually through the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. So I encourage you to take a screenshot of these, uh, take a look if you Google any of these titles or the um, circular numbers or the report numbers, they'll pop up, you can download them free of charge. I do want to say though that there is much more out there. If you look at balanced mix design through TRID or regressing air voids, there's a lot more information out there. I just wanted to provide three examples to get you started and you can take it from there and run. So thank you very much for joining us for the summary of the HMA mix design. We gave a brief background. We looked at the historical mix design procedures, Veeam and Marshall. We looked at the SuperPave mix design procedure. We then looked at SuperPave 5, which is one alternative mix design and three additional alternative mix designs, including the Bailey method, balanced mix design, and regressing air voids. So thank you very much for joining today. I hope you have a wonderful day.